efficient types of bearings now in use at plants around the country. To begin with, we will show you the basic types of sleeve bearings and point out the differences between them and other types of bearings. There are two basic categories of bearings which are widely used in industry today. There are sliding contact bearings and rolling contact bearings. These are rolling contact bearings, also referred to as anti-friction bearings. Rolling contact bearings utilize balls or rollers, which roll between two races, thereby cutting down on friction. The other category is made up of sliding contact bearings, like this, also referred to as sleeve or plane bearings. A sleeve bearing is an unmoving surface on which a moving part such as a shaft or rod, either slides or rolls. It has no balls or rollers, and usually depends on some type of lubrication to help reduce wear and friction. You will often hear sleeve bearings referred to as journal bearings. Well, this is only partially true. We say it's only partially true because all of these bearings, the rolling contact and the sleeve bearings, may be referred to as journal bearings. The term journal is the name for the part of the shaft which fits inside the bearings. Therefore, both rolling contact and sleeve bearings can be considered journal bearings. However, in this training module, we are concerned with only one category of journal bearing, the sleeve bearing. There are two basic types of sleeve bearings now in common use. They are the solid type and the split type. Of course, there are variations to both of these types, some of which you will be shown later. These are the two basic types we just mentioned, the solid sleeve on the left and the split sleeve on the right. As you can see, the solid sleeve bearing looks like a section of tubing or pipe, the name for the other type is obvious, since the bearing is split lengthwise down the center of the bearing. It is the most common type in use. Standard sleeve bearings, such as these, usually range in size from less than one and a half inches ID to four and one half inches ID. Other sleeve bearings, even larger, can be made for nearly any size shaft. A properly installed and lubricated sleeve bearing will often last as long as the equipment it's mounted in. Another variation in sleeve bearing has to do with the thickness of the bearing wall. As shown here, the wall thickness can vary considerably depending on the application and the requirements of the equipment in which it is installed. Now let's examine some of the advantages and disadvantages of sleeve bearings. To begin with, Sleeve bearings can support very heavy loads at high speeds. They usually require less radial space for installation, which is a very important consideration in some machines and equipment. Sleeve bearings are also normally quieter in operation than most rolling contact bearings, since they have no moving parts. Because of their solid construction, they have a much better resistance to unexpected overload and shock conditions. Contamination, such as dirt, dust, and other foreign particles, are less likely to damage sleeve bearings than the precision rolling contact bearings. This is true because the smaller particles will embed themselves in the soft bearing material, resulting in less damage to the bearing. Another advantage of sleeve bearings over the rolling contact category is that they do not require as much care in storage. Sleeve bearings may be stored just about anywhere indefinitely with a minimal amount of deterioration. This is not true of rolling contact bearings. One of the disadvantages of sleeve bearings is that they require more axial or linear space than a comparable rolling contact bearing. Another disadvantage of sleeve bearings is that they generally require considerably more lubricant than a comparable rolling contact bearing. Sleeve bearings also create 
a greater load on the driver during startup, since the shaft is riding directly on the bearing, at which time there is a greater chance of damage to the shaft journal than would be the case where rolling contact bearings are used. However, once it reaches operating speed, the friction decreases since the shaft is riding on an oil film and not directly on the bearing itself. Those are the primary advantages and disadvantages of sleeve bearings. The bearings themselves may be manufactured from several different metals, depending on their application. The shell of the bearing, pointed out here, is usually made of cast iron, bronze, or aluminum. Sleeve bearings with a shell of aluminum or bronze may have a lining, or they may not. However, sleeve bearings with a shell of cast iron will normally have a lining, such as the Babbitt lining being pointed out here. This will also hold true for some aluminum and bronze shell bearings, as we mentioned a moment ago. The lining, or coating, which is used in sleeve bearings, may be made of any of a variety of materials, such as these. Aluminum, copper lead, cadmium base, overplated silver, and babbitt. Of all the different metals, a tin or lead-based babbitt is the most commonly used. Babbitt is an alloy made of several metals which is applied as a thin coating over the shell. In larger sleeve bearings for heavy-duty equipment, a thicker layer of babbitt is used to line a rigid backing of steel, bronze, or cast iron. You are not expected to select bearings for use in equipment. The manufacturer of the equipment will specify exactly what type of bearing is to be used. This is true because sleeve bearings are often designed specifically for a certain application. They are not standardized to the same degree that rolling contact bearings are. If in doubt, refer to the manufacturer's manual. We have some questions for you now in exercise one of your workbook. During this segment of our course on sleeve bearings, we will explain the principles of operation of the two basic types of sleeve bearings you were shown during the last segment, split and solid sleeve. Here is an illustration showing a rotating shaft in a sleeve bearing. As the surface of the shaft slides over the surface of the bearing, friction is generated. The friction creates heat, which increases the load on the driver. The result is that it takes more horsepower to turn the shaft, along with other undesirable side effects. The friction we have been describing may be reduced through the use of a lubricant. In other words, a film of lubricant between the shaft and the bearing separates the two parts during operation, reducing the friction and also helping to dissipate any heat which is generated. The lubricant may be introduced into the bearing by a variety of methods. Force-feed lubrication systems, as shown here, are used frequently to pump oil through the bearings of various machines. If grease is used as a lubricant, it may be introduced through one of several different methods, and this would include grease fittings or a grease pocket, as shown in this illustration. Another common method of lubricating sleeve bearings with oil is the use of oil rings, which pick the lubricant up out of a sump below the bearings and carry it up to the bearings as the rings rotate on the shaft. Since there is such a variety of lube systems in use, we won't go into detailed explanations of how they work in this course. You should already be familiar with the basic systems now in use. Once the lubricant reaches the bearing itself, the bearing design takes care of the distribution of the lubricant along the shaft journal. For instance, this bearing is lubricated by grease. The grease is forced downward by gravity through a slot in the top of the bearing until it comes into contact with the shaft. You won't encounter this type often, since most sleeve bearings are lubricated with oil and not grease. Oil-lubricated bearings are a different story. As we mentioned earlier, 
two basic methods of getting oil to the bearing are oil rings, as shown on the left, or a force-feed lube system, which is shown on the right. Once the oil reaches the bearing, it is distributed along the shaft through oil grooves, which are machined into the surface of the bearing itself. The workman is now pointing to one type of groove, known as an axial groove, since it is parallel to the axis of the shaft. Note that the groove stops short of the end of the bearing. This is to prevent the lubricant from running out of the end of the bearing during operation of the machine. This is called a circumferential oil groove. It channels the flow of lubricant around the circumference of the shaft and bearing. Circumferential oil grooves are also used as collector grooves, as shown in this bearing. The oil flows along the length of the bearing, then collects in this circumferential collector groove, and is channeled back to the oil sump through these drain passages from the groove. This arrangement helps to prevent leakage of the lubricant out of the end of the bearings. This bearing is pressure lubricated. The oil is introduced, under pressure, into the bearing through the hole in the bearing shell, being pointed out here by the workman. It is then distributed along the length of the bearing by the axial grooves until it reaches the collector grooves. Once in the collector grooves, the oil is channeled through the drain holes back to the reservoir. You will soon find that sleeve bearings often incorporate both types of grooves in varying patterns and designs. This illustration shows several different patterns which were designed by the manufacturer for specific applications. In most cases, you will not be concerned with oil groove design. Since the manufacturer has engineered them with his machine in mind, the two basic types of sleeve bearings we have dealt with so far, the split sleeve and the solid sleeve, were designed to restrict the radial movement of the shaft during operation of the machine. And as we also mentioned, you will encounter variations to these types. Here is a common variation. Which you will probably encounter quite frequently. These are sleeve bearings with a thrust shoulder. They are designed to restrict both the radial and axial movements of the shaft. Here is a split sleeve bearing with thrust shoulders being pointed out. As you can see, the thrust faces are also coated with the same Babbitt lining, which is used on the inside of the bearing. Sleeve bearings with thrust faces will normally have oil grooves which run all the way to the ends, as shown here. This is necessary since lubricant must be supplied to the thrust faces of the bearings. Oil grooves in the thrust face, like these, then distribute the oil across the face of the bearing during operation. As with the basic sleeve bearing. There is a film of lubricant between the shoulder on the bearing and the bearing surface of the rotating assembly. This type of sleeve bearing then controls both the radial and axial movement of the shaft. And that concludes our examination of the operating principles of sleeve bearings. We have some questions for you now in exercise number two in your workbook.